Broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Nantan Lupan. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. I'm excited to be bringing my first review of a film noir classic. So let's jump right into episode 38, 99 River Street, 1953. This movie was written for the screen and shows the gritty life of an ex-boxer turned cabbie that gets involved with gangsters as a result of his wife's infidelity. John Payne played the role of ex-boxer and current cab driver Ernie Driscoll. Payne was born in 1912 to a well-to-do family. He was raised in Roanoke, Virginia. The easy life continued until the death of his father, forcing Payne to withdraw from school to help support the family. He eventually went to Columbia where he studied journalism. Besides working as a nurse and a singer, he made extra money boxing and wrestling. Did I mention that he was six foot four inches tall? While working in a play, he was seen by Samuel Goldwyn. Goldwyn offered him a contract and he had a minor role in Dodsworth, 1936. Shortly after this, he was released from the studio. He started doing a bit of freelancing work in comedies and musicals. Paramount took his contract in 1937 and he was in Bob Hope's College Swing, 1938. That same year, he was in Garden of the Moon, 1938, a Busby Berkeley musical with co-star Pat O'Brien. In 1940, he went to work for 20th Century Fox. He started making some pretty good movies that included Tin Pan Alley, 1940, Weekend in Havana, 1941, and in Sun Valley Serenade, 1941, and Iceland, 1942, with Norwegian three-time Olympic figure skater Sonja Henney. It's his work in Remember the Day, 1941, with Claudette Colbert, when he did some of his finest work. He also starred with Betty Grable in Springtime in the Rockies, 1942, before spending two years in the U.S. Army. After the military, he was in The Dolly Sisters, 1945, with Betty Grable. Following World War II, he starred in some very fine movies. These movies include Sentimental Journey, 1946, with Maureen O'Hare. Great Epic of Life, The Razor's Edge, 1946, co-starring Gene Tierney and Tyrone Powers. Miracle on 34th Street, 1947, again with O'Hara, and Larceny, 1948. He left 20th Century Fox in the late 1940s and began making a standard fare of movies that include El Paso, 1949, Tripoli, 1950, Passage West, 1951, Kansas City Confidential, 1952, 99 River Street, 1953, Silverload, 1954, and Slightly Scarlet, 1956. He had a TV show, The Restless Gun, from 1957 to 58. In 1961, he was hit by a car in New York. It took a couple of years before he could return to acting, and he was affected by the accident later in life. By the 1970s, he was reduced to TV only. In 1975, he retired to a quiet life, and passed away at the age of 77 in 1989. Evelyn Keyes played Linda James, aspiring actress and friend to Driscoll. Keyes was a B actress, but she had many first-rate movies, including Here Comes Mr. Jordan, 1951, The Jolson Story, 1946, Mrs. Mike, 1949, The Prowler, 1951, and 99 River Street, 1953. She never really received the attention she deserved. Keyes was a very attractive actress, but this movie did not do her justice. It could be the poodle-curled hairstyle or the excessive close-ups of her eyes shifting from side to side showing she was thinking. Keyes was born in Texas in 1916. When her father died, she was moved to Atlanta, Georgia to live with her mother and grandmother. She grew up taking dancing and voice lessons and hoped to be a ballerina. Instead, she worked as a chorus girl before moving to California when she was 20. Not long after she got to Hollywood, she somehow met Cecil B. DeMille. As a result of this meeting, she was given a Paramount contract. She was given a small part in a pirate film, The Buccaneer, 1938, which was followed by a part in Union Pacific, 1939. David O. Selznick cast her as Sue Lynn O'Hara, the younger sister of Scarlet in Gone with the Wind, 1939. She was signed with Columbia Pictures, and after she started dating director Charles Vidor, she made three films for him. The Lady in Question, 1940, Ladies in Retirement, 1941, and The Desperados, 1943. While at Columbia, Keys played some top roles such as Boris Karloff's daughter in the crime horror film Before I Hang, 1940, and as a blind woman who friends horribly scarred Peter Lorre in The Face Behind the Mask, 1941. 
but every time there would be a low-budget clinker to go along with the good roles. These included films such as Dangerous Blondes, 1943, Beyond the Sacramento, 1940, A Thousand and One Nights, 1945, or The Thrill of Brazil in 1946. She was married to director John Houston from 1946 through 50. During this time, she was in the Jolson Story, 1946, film noir classic Johnny O'Clock, 1947 with Dick Powell, and in the title role of the comedy The Mating of Millie, 1948, which co-starred Glenn Ford. Later in life, she appeared in TV shows as a guest and wrote a couple of tell-all books. She died at the age of 99. Brad Dexter played Victor Rollins, the diamond thief and primary bad guy. Dexter specialized in playing tough guys. He was born in Nevada in 1917. As an adult, he boxed and trained at the Pasadena Playhouse. He joined the Air Corps during World War II. He ended up being in the play Winged Victory. After the war, John Houston spotted him in a play and cast him as the heavy in the Asphalt Jungle 1950. All through the 50s, he played the same type of role in dramas and westerns. His most famous role was as one of the seven in The Magnificent Seven 1960. However, he was overshadowed by the other actors. In the 1970s, he shifted into producing. Frank Phelan played Stan Hogan, friend and boss of Driscoll. Phelan was from a vaudeville family, and both before and after college, he worked in vaudeville as well. When the tour traveled to Los Angeles, he was given a screen test, and as a result, had a 30-year career acting. He has had several famous roles, such as the mean male nurse, Bim, in The Lost Weekend, 1945, and as the cab driver, Ernie, in It's a Wonderful Life, 1946. It's funny that he played a cabbie in that movie also. In It's a Wonderful Life, his friend the cop was named Bert, and the names were given to the Sesame Street pair based on these roles. He is perhaps best known as the father of TV's Dobie on The Many Loves of Dobie Gillis, 1959. He retired after acting in Funny Girl, 1968, and died in 1985. Peggy Castle played Pauline Driscoll, the unfaithful wife of Ernie Driscoll. Castle was described as a tall, blonde-haired, green-eyed beauty. Her career did not reflect her looks, however. She was confined to B-rolls and generally played the other woman in movies such as Harem Girls 1952, Wagons West 1952, The Prince Who Was a Thief 1951, and Jesse James's Woman 1954. Her best roles include Payment on Demand 1951 with Betty Davis, 99 River Street 1953, I, The Jury 1953, The White Orchid 1954, Miracle in the Rain, 1956, and Seven Hills of Rome, 1957. In television for three years, she played the sexy saloon girl girlfriend of Marshal Dan Troop in the Western Lawman, 1958. That sounds a lot like Gunsmoke. She left acting in 1962. Castle developed a heavy drinking problem and died of cirrhosis of the liver in 1973 at the young age of 45. Jay Adler played Christopher the Diamond Fence, and all-around tough guy. Adler was born in 1896 in New York City. I'm seeing a trend. He was from an acting family and had almost 100 TV and movie credits. He is best known for 99 River Street, 1953, The Killing, 1956, The Family Jewels, 1965, and The Big Combo, 1955. He died in 1978. Jack Lambert played Mickey, a member of the Diamond Fencing Gang. He was from Yonkers, New York. I'm seeing a trend. Beginning in acting during World War II and continuing through the 1970s, Lambert never received the credit he deserved. Lambert was a decent actor and he had the look of a tough guy, and that is what he specialized in. Story. The movie begins with a heavyweight boxing match, but it pulls back and Ernie Driscoll, John Payne, is watching it on a small television set. He is one of the fighters on the TV from four years earlier. Driscoll is about to win the heavyweight championship when a freak hit to his eye causes the fight to be stopped, making Driscoll lose. The referee is leading Driscoll to his corner. Hey, Doc. Driscoll is protesting to the referee. He does not Are want to having a good stop. time? The doctor is coming into the ring. He is examining Ernie's right eye. There's no doubt there's something critically the matter with Driscoll's eye. There's something the matter with it, all right. 
Lance Hart going to stop the fight. Maybe you Rest think I'm enjoying it. Knockout in the second round. Great fights of yesterday has just brought you motion pictures of the championship bout between Sailor Braxton and Ernie Driscoll. Next week... Next week, Driscoll will be driving a taxi. No need to be sore about it. His wife will be making corsages at the Broadway florist shop. You know that's only temporary. Pinning them on women who had more sense than to marry a prize fighter. He is also banned from fighting because he could lose his sight if hit again. Driscoll is living in a small apartment with his resentful wife. He is working as a taxi driver, and nothing he wants to do is good enough for her. She says he kept her from becoming a star, even though she was only a showgirl when they met. I'd have been a star if I hadn't married you. You were a showgirl. His wife, Pauline Driscoll, Peggy Castle, is working at a florist, and she is showing signs of having an affair. She goes back to finish her night shift in a huff. Driscoll's dispatcher and buddy, Stan Hogan, Frank Phelan, meets him at the drugstore where they hang out. Stan advises him having kids to fix his marital problems. Flowers, dinner, drinks, whisper in her ear, then make a baby. Look, you ain't kidding me, none. Right away you figure you're not the top man in Pauline's life anymore just because you have a couple spats. Okay. Every married couple has spats. Don't take it so serious. Okay. You know what fixes you and Pauline? You have a couple kids. Driscoll thinks this is a good idea. Exactly how many times was he hit in the head while boxing? So Driscoll buys the big box of chocolates. About this time, his other friend, Linda James, played by Evelyn Keys, tells him she is auditioning for a spot on Broadway. She is supposed to see the producer at 9 p.m. No alarm bells go off. Driscoll goes to surprise pick up Pauline, but surprise! Victor Rollins, Brad Dexter, is there telling Pauline about the robbery they plan and how he took $50,000 worth of diamonds off the Dutchman. They plan to leave on a boat after they sell the hot diamonds to a fence named Christopher J. Adler. They also have to get forged passports. When Driscoll pulls up, he sees Pauline and Victor playing kissy face in the florist. Victor walks right up to the cab and says 300 parks south. When Pauline gets there, she realizes it's Driscoll. He drives away. Not too much of a hothead. Pauline says he will kill her, and then they go to the location of the fence. The fence operation is in a pet store. Christopher tells him not to bring Pauline in the back, but Victor does anyway. In any event, I never deal with women. The other fence in the store is Mickey, Jack Lambert. Christopher tells Rollins he made a mistake and that he never deals with women. Mickey pulls a gun, and Christopher says again he never deals with women. Then Mickey says that Rollins killed the Dutchman during the robbery. Pauline freaks out and Rollins slaps her. Driscoll comes back to the cab shop and takes it all out on Stan for giving bad advice. Stan advises him to go get a cup of coffee and that they will meet and talk at the end of the shift. Linda is at the drugstore, desperate to find Driscoll. Linda tells him she killed a man. She tells him they have to go to the theater and when they do, there is a sign for the play which is titled, They Call It Murder. When they go backstage, there is a body lying by a chair. She gives the basic story that the producer, Waldo Daggett, Ian Wolf, sexually assaulted her and she killed him with an iron poker. Linda really looks crazy while she is telling her tale. He's lying there. Take it easy, kid. When you clip toe the chin, it's exactly when you have to keep your head. Otherwise, you get your brains knocked out. Driscoll says he will load the body into the cab like an old drunk, drive him to the Hudson River, and dump the body in a gravel pit. When Driscoll grabs the body, the lights come on and everyone is alive. They offer Driscoll $20 for his words. Insulted and feeling betrayed, he hits the men. They are going to call the police for publicity. Driscoll drives to Pullman's gym, where he has a day mare with the mirror, and he tells Pop Durkee, Eddie Waller, that he wants back into the fight game. Pop will not let him fight, but finally Pop says, if Driscoll has to fight, it will be for him. Pauline calls Stan and asks if Driscoll can come pick her up. She says the address is 304 Park South, a bar. Driscoll goes into the bar and starts drinking. Wow, is that a good thing for a cabbie to do? Rollins puts a scarf around Pauline's throat and strangles her. After one drink, Driscoll storms out and doesn't notice the dead woman in the back seat of his cab. He drives back to his apartment to look for Pauline. He begins packing to move out. The doorbell rings and it's Linda. When the play people called the police, Linda quit and Driscoll explains his hands are deadly weapons and he will be put in jail if arrested. 
Driscoll opens the back door of the cab, and he and Linda see Pauline's dead body. Linda jumps in to help hide the body. Why is everyone in this movie so willing to help with murders? Driscoll quickly figures out that Rollins did it, and Linda goes along to help. The police are looking for Driscoll at the cab stand for the assault charges. Driscoll and Linda head to 300 Park South to look for Rollins. Driscoll gets the number of the room from the manager who has a foot-long security chain on her door. Only the largest people couldn't get through. Driscoll breaks into the apartment and begins searching. Driscoll is slugged from behind by Mickey from the pet shop who pulls a gun on him. He puts Driscoll in his chair and starts judo chopping him for info. Driscoll gets a jump on Mickey and begins interrogating him. Mickey was trying to get the diamonds for himself. The police find the taxi and Mickey tells Driscoll that Rollins was leaving from Jersey City. Rollins goes to the pet shop and tells Christopher that he got rid of Pauline. He tries to give Christopher the diamonds, but Christopher refuses to give him the money. Rollins forces him to give the 50 k and leaves the diamonds. Driscoll and Linda make it back to the cab stand. They use the call sheets from all the cab companies to try and locate Rollins. Stan lets Driscoll hide upstairs based only on his word that he didn't murder Pauline. Driscoll tells Linda that all dames are the same. It's not your fight. I made it my fight. Look, you're square. Let's call it even. Ernie, I don't enlist very often, but when I do, it's for the duration. Don't mix me up. Women aren't like that. What are women like? They're like the dames that hung around my dressing room after I'd won a fight. All soft fur and perfume they must have put on just before they walked in the door. (laughs) They'd run their hands over my wet shoulders and tell me what a big man I was. It was easy to believe with the yell of the crowd in my ears, but where were the same dames and I'd have got my head kicked in? In the other guy's dressing room. Ernie, you all women aren't like that. They talk about what it would be like if they had met earlier. The police come back looking for the pair. Stan gives them a cover cab. Christopher the Fence knows Rollins is looking for a passport, so they are trying to track him down. Christopher makes contact with Monk, the forger, and finds out the cafe that Rollins is waiting in. Christopher, Mickey, and another guy head out. Stan gives Driscoll the location, and he and Linda head that way, too. Linda goes in to try and lure Rollins outside so Driscoll can beat the truth out of him. While she is inside, Mickey grabs Driscoll and uses a gun to get him back in the car with Christopher and the other man. After a few questions, they knock Driscoll out. Linda is at the bar doing the Southern Deb mating call. I'm so drunk. You say his name was... I didn't say. I'm never going to speak his name again. I'm through with him. Monk comes and gives the passports to Rollins. Linda throws everything but the kitchen sink at Rollins, but he ain't having none. Are you married? Light. You know what's wrong with you? You talk too much. Say something. Beat it. She even does some post-war dirty dancing. Desperate to get him outside, she drops the name of the girl he murdered. She tries to get him out the front door, but he drags her out the back and starts slapping her. About this time, Mickey shows up with a gun and takes the pair towards the dock. Christopher and the car follow. Driscoll wakes up in time to hear that they plan on killing him and Linda. Driscoll socks the driver and presses the gas pedal to the floor. He jumps out just before it crashes into a crane. Mickey starts shooting at Driscoll, and while he is distracted, Rollins wraps him with a giant chain, takes his gun, and runs away. Driscoll sends Linda for the police and goes after Rollins. Rollins shoots him in the chest, but is out of bullets. He hears a forklift and stops his attempted murder. Driscoll summons his inner strength and chases him onto the boat. Driscoll gets knocked down and relives his last fight, but this time winning as he beats Rollins. The harder you hit, the harder you have to hit. The police come, and in the next scene, Driscoll says he's got his gas station and is happily married to Linda. Stan gives him the old whisper-in-her-ear advice. Let me give you a little advice. 
You want to have kids? You got to break it gentle. It's like with Eloise. All the time she's saying, no kids, no kids. I don't want to be tied down. All that sort of stuff, see? So one night I come home, I got a big box of candy. Then I take her around the corner to Giuseppe's for dinner. After dinner, I buy her a couple of brandies. Then when I take her home, you know what I do? I whisper in her ear. That's the way you got to do it, champ. Break it gentle. Driscoll does, and Linda smiles happily. World-famous short summary? Bad advice from Boss leads Xboxer on a long drive. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends. And if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes and give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show notes to my site. Beware the Moors.